Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, live streamers. My name is Alex Taylor, and I'm a licensed spiritual practitioner here at Light on the Mountains. So let's take a moment to go within, and if it's comfortable, close your eyes. And breathe in the delight of this brand new morning with all of the opportunities, the blessings, the gratitude that we have ahead of us. And I give thanks that it is here that we gather to begin our day in this beautiful sanctuary, in this beautiful community in which we live. And I give thanks for spirit that is surrounding us inside and out and grounding us into this space and just being thankful for one another and for Reverend John and RL and all of our leadership council people, our live streamers, and each one of you that is here that provides community and spirituality, spirituality to begin our day. As together we say, and so it is. Um, and I selected a reading today, I read John's blog, I don't know who, you know, I'm sure all of you read it. Um, <laughs> and it was about the shadow side. And I started thinking about it quite literally, you know, like looking at my shadow outside and looking at the different beautiful designs that shadows make and remembering as a child that we were so playful with our shadows and it wasn't a scary thing. And um, I know that the shadow side of us within is, is a different, it's not as literal, but um, so I just invite you to play with looking at shadows. Um, and I realized that my puppy is afraid of shadows, and so it was interesting taking, taking him for a walk yesterday. I was looking at the shadows of the snow and the trees and the clouds and everything, and he was kind of like, oh, what was that? So, um, <laughs> so anyway, I have a little, just a small piece to read about that, which kind of resonated with me, but I'm inviting you to play with your shadows. And it's um, a reading from Science of Mind magazine of this month, and it's Michael Gott, and it's called The Paradox, No Mistakes. And a quote from Ricky Byers, no mistakes have been made in God. All the ways that we seem to fail, in God they all fade. It all fades into God. And then Ernest Holmes, our founder, has a quote from this thing called you. Letting go of all previous mistakes, I know that today I am free and unhindered. Another paradox, we all make mistakes all the time and no mistakes have been made. Holding these seemingly oppositional statements in mind at the same time requires something that Reverend Weldays calls spiritual double vision. We look at the human experience, we all make mistakes, and see through it to the deeper spiritual truth. Everything is integrated into wholeness and perfection. Now, there are many tragedies in human experience that we will never fully reconcile while we are still within this time, space, form, con countryman. But from an eternal perspective, if God is all that is, truly no mistakes can ever be made. Our lives are like tapestry. All our moments and experiences are part of the larger pattern of our story. The painful, <clears throat> excuse me, the painful parts can be difficult to be with, but with perspective, we can see that they are just part of the whole. Everything fits and everything belongs. For many of us, coming to terms with our own choices and actions is the hardest thing to reconcile. When we have been selfish or harmed others, it can be especially challenging to weave those threads into our tapestry pattern. But we can do it. Every seeming mistake can become the portal to our growth and our healing. I'm going to read that one again. Every seeming mistake can become the portal to our growth and our healing. And the affirmation for this is, I welcome the healing of all regret and pain of the past. I walk unburdened into this brilliant new day filled with possibility and promise. And then together we will read our affirmation that's in your insert. And it's the first thing at the top in red. I release and let go in preparation for a greater transformation. RL. Thanks, Alex. Good morning, everyone. A thought of the day on this busy, beautiful spring day. It is a beautiful spring day. It's just not 
the spring that maybe we're hoping for yet. But it's there. It's coming. I mean, think of the abundance of water that will be there to support it. Um, here's my thought. I was driving uh, this morning and listening to NPR, and of course, they were interviewing people who were dealing with the aftermath of the tornadoes in Mississippi, Alabama. And uh, the interviewer was talking to this gentleman who was just on the street and uh, talking about, and this was in an area uh, that was really devastated, and talking about the fact that some of these rural communities, very impoverished, uh, uh, really sort of you know, hanging on by a thread as it was, and now uh, this massive devastation, and, and the fact that not unlike here, everyone knows everyone. So if someone lost their home, well, everyone knows them. Or if someone lost a loved one or their family, everyone knows them. And so the impact that this has on the community. So I was moved by that. And then the interviewer asked this gentleman, well, how long do you think it's going to take to recover? And this was his answer. And I was inspired. He said, oh, it's going to take a minute. He didn't sit there and go, oh, it's going to take the rest of our lives. It's going to take a minute. We're going to have to work at this a little bit. You know, I, I get worried about the little things, you know. Here they are in a community that's been just hit hard. And the answer is, oh, it's going to take a minute. And what I heard him say was, and we're all going to be around to look out for each other and get this done together. And, uh, and we'll wake up in the morning and we'll get done what we can get done in that day. Maybe that's not what he meant at all, but that's what I heard. I didn't hear, I didn't hear the fear and the panic and the, um, the anger and the rage, which I'm sure are also part of the process. Isn't that usually true along the way things aren't one dimensional? All of those other emotions come along and we either tuck them away or we deal with them. But sometimes the things that happen, they take a minute. And sometimes the good stuff, we really want to reap all the benefits of the good stuff. It takes a minute too. And we have to sit with that. And it's worth it. So I'm grateful to this guy on the street in, in Mississippi and I wish him well.
was cleaning my closet. One thing I do this year, twice a year, clean out my closet for you know donations. And I saw my flip flops, and I went, oh. <laughs> I will see you soon. I hope. But we have that. That. In, but there's an. an in September, an inevitability of the whole thing. We know where we're leading, but there's, a, at least for me, a sense of anticipation and joy because I know sooner or later the sun will win out. <laughs> this will melt. <laughs> we will be able to, there is a lawn under there somewhere, and we will be able to walk on it soon. It happens every year. But like, not I'd say like clockwork, but a different clockwork of sorts, it will happen. Um, I've, I've been trying to manipulate the universe that we would have enough meltage that we could have an outside Easter egg hunt on Easter. I'm kind of doubting that will happen. <laughs> yeah, like I said, there, you can put eggs around snow mounds, but when you can't even like walk around snow mounds, that's, that's not going to happen. But there is, this time of year, this anticipation of possibility. I mean, you can't help but not get on board with that. That as we are coming out of this winter season, and not that we've just been staying indoors the whole time, but we look forward to the later spring and summer. There's all these activities we look forward to. In fact, I think we overschedule ourselves in summers way too much because the, the timing is so sweet and so precious that we, that we just go for it. And of course, Obviously, when we look at the balancing of, of what we call the light and the dark, I think we have more an appreciation for the light. It's the stuff we like. Um, but metaphorically, the things that we say are dark, or as, as um, Alex referred to as our shadow cells, we have a, a tendency to want to put it aside a little bit. Now, first of all, there's not, let's get this clear, there's not like good parts of us and bad parts of us. And they say, oh, you know, I'm this evil shadow self on whatever. It's like, you know, there's things that we put aside that we would prefer not to look at. And I think most of us have become very adept at not looking at certain things. And so what are some of those things that are lurking in the darkness um, that we may have kind of brushed under the rug? And actually, I, we invited you to, to start this process as we came into this period before Easter that we call Lent of preparation, of, of going within and cleaning out some of the, this, you know, the dust bunnies and, and things that, that are lurking there in, the, in what we call the, the darkness. And so as we go into the light, it's good time now to kind of take a checkup as we are. You know, metaphorically, Easter is coming, a time of a renewal. How are we doing with this time of preparation? challenge you all a few weeks ago to, to go within and say, well, what is it something I may want to give up or release or let go finally? Um, I don't know if you remember that, but check in. And if you didn't do that, never, no time like the present. What seemingly is in the darkness there that we would like to give a, a little bit of consideration? <laughs> and again, there, it's not bad, dark. It is things that we have preferred not to look at. And so what are some of the things in there? You know, the top of our list are things that we have come to believe about ourselves that aren't true. And there's lots of things that come under that category. Things that we've come to believe about ourselves that aren't true. That in science of mind we call false beliefs. It may beliefs that we aren't worthy on some level, we're not capable on some level, that we have an imposter syndrome on some level, that, um, that we shouldn't really be doing what we're doing because we're actually having a clue of what we're doing. And maybe we all feel that to a certain extent at different times. So just like it's a good time of year to go into your closets and see what your donation to the gold mine is, and those who don't live in our community, it's, our, it's a high-end thrift store. We all get very excited about going to the gold mine, especially when they launch the new season. You know, the new season spring launch is going to come soon. And actually, we have people line up to get into the gold mine on the, on the, the launch season. It's really kind of crazy. So do a little inventory here. What, what, what is it that we can look at? What is it that we want to have an invitation possibly to let go? So where do we start there? I like to start with telling the truth. 
telling the truth of who we are, really, um, and looking at these things that we carry, what is the real truth with that? And of course, this thing of truth is, is kind of a, a tricky little thing. So here's one of my pet peeves I, I like to berate a little bit. There's like when someone comes to me and says, I'm, I need to talk to you and speak my own truth. I'm like, uh-oh, here it comes. So I'm not talking about that sort of thing, like a small s truth kind of thing, or like, yes, I need to tell you, as opposed to telling the truth is a conversation you have with yourself. It's not something you lay on another person necessarily, even though we do have to have truthful conversations. So in this kind of looking within this time of year, what you would like to clear out that to raise our level of telling the truth. Now, certainly, truth about worthiness and things like that are really appropriate. But to look at, so what's going on in your life right now? Are you in a big transformation moment in your life? We all have two or three, maybe four big ones. You know the big ones where it's like everything changed? Or you might be in just we're in every day let go change sort of thing, if, if that's a thing. And to think where you are. And, and even if you're not in one of the big ones, it's a good time as we are in this preparatory time to review the big ones. Because here's what I've found as I look back to the couple really big ones in my life, is that as they say that that, that old metaphor of, of the onion layers and the peels, that we can return to some of our big lessons of the past and go even deeper with it. Go, oh, I can really see this now in a way that I didn't before. And as you do that, whether you're in the big one now or we want to review the big ones now, to tell the <coughs> truth about what happened, your part in it and how you participated in it. And if it's something in the rear view mirror, how did you, through telling the truth on some level, bring forth a healing and transformation in your life that can be an example of how to do that today with other things. I mean, think about it. Remember the, um, the big, last big truth telling event I had was just coming out of the school of ministry. It was really a two year period. And you know how you can feel the, it coming? like there's a big truth episode coming, or maybe you're thinking just big transformational thing, like I, you may not even know what it is, but it's like, I feel like something's coming. Um, and I was feeling that. But it's funny when you're, we, we allow ourselves to get so busy in our lives, and I was of course in a master's program, it was so easy to say, I will deal with that later. I've got too many classes to take now, I've got papers to write, I've got things to do, and, graduations to, to celebrate and all that sort of thing. But when you come out of that busyness and suddenly you're left with, oh, now I really need to look at it. And as I was kind of brewing with this, um, about that time I went on a week's retreat that CSL for many years had a week's retreat in Pacific Grove, California, the Asilomar. And um, like I said, there has been so many major decisions made with people walking on that beach. So it, you don't need to sit in meditation, you just need to look at the ocean. And it's amazing how it just, and, and my, my goal was to finally look straight in the face of where actually I wasn't telling myself the truth. You know, and it, what is so interesting is that you actually open yourself up to guidance and information, it comes. But often what comes is you may not like what first comes. And I think the first couple days, it was like, there has to be a different answer, right? No, no, that, that, that sounds nice and lovely, but wouldn't it be better or easier if I did? And of course, the ocean kept telling me, no. The first thing was the thing. And in that, just thinking, how do you do this? And the kind of the guidance I got is, you tell the truth in your life in the same order that was revealed to you here as you're looking at the ocean. But what's so interesting with that, with telling the truth, and maybe you, you have this experience or not have experience, there's almost this thing of, if I just keep it here and don't say anything, it'll be okay. 
Nothing has to go through any change. And have you ever done that? Because you kind of know you're going to bring on a storm in your life a little bit. So it's like, but you know, I could just be quiet and everything will just be dandy, so to speak. And the ocean was saying, no, that's not going to work. No, that, nice suggestion, but not going to work. And so I did that. And basically, without going into details, my, in the short term, my life did fall apart. But it fell on the part in the way that it needed to fall apart. It's funny, I just, um, I just love these little TikTok videos. I don't know if anyone else is obsessed with it. But um, there was a, this woman talking about how the key to success and how famous people we know, how they quote unquote failed. And she says, do you know that someone fired Oprah when she was 23? And then there was an interview who says, well, I guess that was a mistake. She says, no, not a mistake. She couldn't become Oprah unless she was fired at 23. I mean, isn't, I just thought, well, yeah. Isn't that interesting? She couldn't become Oprah unless she faced getting fired and just kind of getting batted around a little bit at 23 and kind of like, okay, let's tell the truth here. What are we really doing kind of thing? So that's what these telling the truth things are. It's like we see it sometimes as stepping back or maybe failing or giving something up. And what really is, it's clearing the, um, you know, the deck here so you can really get down to what it is you need to do. And in the short term, it can feel painful. It can feel like everything is falling apart, which it very well may be. But like I said, it's clearing the deck. So as we are in this preparatory time to ask ourselves, where do I need to tell myself the truth at a deeper level? And as you do so, the next thing to ask the ocean or ask Redfish Lake or ask the trail that you're on with your dogs this week to allow the idea of then what's the process I need to go through? Had a really great, a lot of great reading this week, but reading some, some our old friend, uh, Uncle Ernie, uh, Ernest Holmes, and for the class that we have. And a subject that I, I, I was looking for this morning because I wanted to share it with you, but I couldn't find it. You know how you're like going through books trying to find something you read? But it was so on, on point for this kind of subject. So in the class we're getting, that I'm facilitating, it's got the power of your word, meaning that you can, in a sense, through your thoughts and beliefs, claim a different type of life for yourself. Again, I'm not saying that you can have your laundry list of everything you want, but you can completely change your direction. And when Ernest Holmes talks about this prayer, often he talks about it in the, in the realm of the absolute. It's like, this is it. You're accepting it. It's, it's here now. And you have to do that in the mind of spirit. But in this part that I'm going to have to look for again this week because I can't find it, uh, he's saying, and it usually brings forth a process that you have to trust that very rarely is it poofed into existence in your front living room. But you have to be completely on board to get the wheels a turning, so to speak. And that you participate and tell the truth along the way and say the process has begun because we are in the realm of time and space and physicality and that things are rarely just boom into our life. But to absolutely believe that it fully exists and that the process is happening. And that, again, on the level of spirit, it is completely done. And so even with this, as in our letting go, that we start the process by believing and allowing the process. And the first part is, of course, telling the truth. The second part that I was looking at this week is to, I know this sounds like so, so obvious, but it's not, to increase our level of trust and faith. And what does that mean? We don't believe that there's magical beings that just do things for us. I believe that we raise our vibration to the, and increase our level of receptivity. And since we are in a process, we have to have greater trust that if it's not here yet, it still exists. And we... we the weird fears that we have in the little darkness stuff that we like to hide. So we all say, yes, I would like transformation. 
I'm on board for transformation, but then we start to come into this, uh, the, our little fears in here. Well, I'm all on board for transformation, but what if that means I lose my job or my investments or something along that line? What if that means is that this relationship that I know shouldn't be here but that I'm clawing onto for dear life will go away? W what will happen? That w we kind of work, the, work these strange deals in our mind. It's like, yes, I want change and transformation, but this one thing, I, I think you really should be on board with it not going away for me. <laughs> and course, the clue is that's probably the thing that needs to go most. It's like, you know, you're just like holding on to it. It's like, you know, that's really the thing you just need to like day one, just work to get rid of it sort of thing. But our fear can go around this, this thing that's at the core of what we need to, to let go, but yet we think that inviting this new experience somehow, not only will that let go, but it will ruin our lives on some level. Or it will just, you know, our lives will just be in a sense of destruction on some level. So the path of letting go and balancing the light on the dark is coming to a point that n everything is on the table to let go. Everything. Even the things that are pretty good. Because everything that has its season. Haven't you been in a period of your life that it was such a great period of your life and it was amazing and this thing was great. Maybe it was a job or a relationship, whatever, but you intuitively came to a point that I think that time is over now. Haven't we all had that? It's like it was amazing and it was wonderful, but suddenly nothing wrong with the person, nothing wrong with me, but it's just time that there's something else that's wanting to come forth. And it is part of our human nature to say, well, but this has been so precious and wonderful. Can this be the one thing that you can't touch? You know, spirit, divine, whatever it is over here. You're like, yeah, can we just kind of keep this? Because it's been so amazing for the last 15, 20, whatever years. And again, we have to work on our trust and faith to say that we have to be willing to have a complete clean slate. It doesn't mean that it's all going to go away. But part of this process is to give up our attachment to it not going away, if that makes some sense. It's like I'm pr absolutely okay with blessing it on its way if it's time for it to go. And even if it was something that was very healthy and wonderful and amazing, that in a time of, of looking within and saying, what, what's the next step here, to really be 100% on board with a clean slate. And that's not always an easy place to get to. And if you're at one of those big transitional points in your life, it's doubly important to get to that space. Because I know when I've been, again, hey, those big transition points, you're like, well, can I just pack a little overnight bag of the stuff from where I was before? You know, um, fond moments, you know, highlights that I can hold on to. And it's like, well, kind of know that you really have to, in those moments especially, be ready for it to, and again, it, we, our fears is like, it's all going away. I'll be destitute. Nobody will be in my life. Or, no, the right things are going to come back. And as we metaphorically release our attachment to all that there is in this moment. So if you want a true transformational moment as we're coming to Easter, to really say, I am on board to release it all. Scary, isn't it? <laughs> it's real scary. So again, if you're in a big change point, look at that in a big way. If you're not, look at the gradual changes that are always coming forward in your life and possibly revisit some of the, the big ones and just say, well, what further can I, what might, did I, am I still holding on to? even though that was a great transformation. What, how, can I, how can I challenge myself to really kind of let this go? So I guess the next question is how can you, what kind of spiritual practice can we do for this in a sense? Um, I think sometimes as human beings, spiritual human beings, we need to make 
a statement of source. That we can't just have things going on in our head. I think sometimes it's good to have someone else close to us witness verbally what we're willing or the fact that we're willing to release our attachment. I think writing things down sometimes can be worthwhile to even our pen and paper is a witness. And somehow, actual pen, pencil, and paper, um, even in cursive somehow, it just, you're like attaching to the piece of paper and, and, and making some sort of commitment, so much more than, than a screen for me. And in some of my reading this week, at the end of a chapter of a book I'm reading, talking about metaphorically using the idea of an altar and putting on the altar what you're ready to let go. So anyhow, uh, one thing that I believe in teaching science of mind, there is not a spot where spirit is not. But there are places that we come that we recognize it more, in a sense. That they're kind of like touch stones. Um, like if you've ever been to a big cathedral in Europe that people have been praying for 700 years, it's not that that place is more holy, but people have come to recognize the holiness of the divine in that spot. And you can feel it. You can kind of radiate it. It's almost like you can just go sit there and not even consciously pray. You can just like take it in. Because people, again, for hundreds of years have done that. So this is the idea of either metaphoric or an actual altar to say that I'm going to use this as a means of letting go. Now it's funny, culturally, in thousands of years, this, you know, when we have an idea of a supreme being that supposedly needs to be given gifts or tribute. We don't go there. But an altar can be a place rather than something that will give me stuff. It's like, help me give this away. So think of, you know, we're going to do this in a minute with our eyes closed, but think of if you were going to have some sort of sacred place in your home, um, what would symbolize your life, your belief in spirit, God, the divine? And knowing that you're recognizing that presence right there, that you can, could either in your mind, or you could take an object that represents something or a quality that you're ready to let go and put that on that altar, what would that be? So, for, so what would your altar look like? Again, this is, this is just symbolism. There's nothing like magical by doing this. What would it look like? That it would be represent your connection to the divine. Just think of that. What would it look like? Just be a little alcove in the corner. What would it look like? That you would, that just by looking at it would bring on kind of a prayerful kind of feeling. And let's just think now, as you are in this time of, we're on the other side of the equinox, the days are getting longer, and we're bringing summer in, but still, what might be lurking in our shadow cells that you're just, you're so ready to be done with? And what object may be in your home that you could infuse that thing and put in there as a, as a symbol that you could put on the altar. That you could say this little, I don't know, piece of paper even, is symbolizing this thing that I am ready to release my attachment to. What would that be? And just imagine yourself now, um, and, and it could even be something like our, our birding bowl service in January where you take a piece of paper, write something on, and you put it in a little flame great symbolism of letting something go. But see yourself, first of all, okay, we know what the altar looks like. Two, what is the thing, idea, belief that we are ready to commit to letting go our attachment to? What object might represent that? And just envision yourself now putting that item that idea on that altar. And just see yourself like your hands are 
you have this object in your hand and you place it on the altar and you step back and know in your consciousness that you can never go back and pick it up again. It's immovable. It's gone. And since we're in the realm of visualization, imagine the next day you go back to look at it and it is gone. It disappeared. So in this, these last couple weeks as we prepare for transformation, the symbolism of Easter, it's time to make a commitment to letting go. We've been talking about it way too much. What goes on the altar? See yourself walk away, never to see it again. And so it is. <laughs>